Hi everyone. In these final two videos for this course, I would like to talk about the topic that's very much at the heart of my own research, which is the relation between human rights and human rights law on the one hand, and migration and more specifically vulnerable migrants on the other one. In the first clip, I'll talk a little bit about the general legal framework that establishes so-called international protection for forced migrants. And in the second clip, I'll move on more specifically to the notion of migratory vulnerability as I have proposed it for use in human rights law. And I will also there discuss and answer the reading questions that were posed for today. Now, let me start by saying that in this one video, in this one clip, I cannot obviously cover all the intricacies of the multi-layer, multi-level protection system that exists when it comes to forced migrants, to migrants, refugees, and their rights. So I provide a brief overview here, starting, of course, with the 1951 Refugee Convention, which is the pillar the real foundation of the system of international protection as it exists today. Brief side note here, when in international law we talk about international protection, that usually very specifically refers to the protection that is afforded to forced migrants. So people who cannot stay in their country for very specific reasons, most notably because they are running the risk of serious human rights violations there and are therefore finding themselves in other places. This, of course, includes most notably refugees, but not only. And this, in fact, already brings me to the first and arguably most important function of the 1951 Refugee Convention, also sometimes referred to as the Geneva Convention, which is that it establishes the refugee definition. More specifically, in Article 1a2, it establishes that, and it is worth reading this out in full, that a refugee, owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his or for that matter, her nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail him or herself of the protection of that country. Now, there is a lot in this definition. I, in fact, once took a week's long course only on this definition at the University of Michigan, so I cannot possibly cover all the intricacies here. However, what I can say is that in this definition, what is actually included are six specific criteria that somebody needs to meet in order to qualify as a refugee. This includes, as you can see here from the definition, a well-founded fear, so objective reasons for being afraid of staying in one's country. The fact that this fear needs to be connected to membership in a particular group, such as having a particular political opinion or religious group, this definition, by the way, is open-ended because it also includes a particular social group. One has to find oneself outside the home country and unable to receive protection in the home country, so in another place in the same country. And then, and this is not specifically mentioned in this provision, but in Article 1F, one also should not be a fugitive. Obviously, if one is being persecuted by one's country for, for example, one's religion, political opinion. That's different from being a regular criminal fugitive, somebody who has committed a crime and is just simply trying to escape justice for non-political uh, or other kind of offenses covered in the refugee convention. The overall idea of the refugee convention is to provide so-called surrogate protection, meaning that because you're not able to enjoy the rights that you usually would in your own country, which ideally or normally has also committed to human rights treaties, the whole state where you find yourself in will provide for the next best thing, for a kind of surrogate protection. And the Refugee Convention therefore mentions a number of rights that I will not enumerate here, but that make it basically a human rights instrument for this specific group. Now, moving on, so to say, to the second pillar of the international protection system, which are indeed the human rights treaties. 
they provide for so-called complementary protection and that is actually quite important because if you look back once more at the definition of a refugee as proposed in the convention you will see that certain people are excluded from it most notably of course so-called war refugees so persons who are maybe not individually being persecuted by a state but who because their country is in a general state of war for example in a civil war they are not possibly able to stay in that country without risking their lives and the lives of their family. At the heart of this complementary protection is the so-called non-refoulement principle, which is established specifically, for example, in the Convention Against Torture, which, and again, I find this worthwhile reading out, in Article 3 proposes that no state party shall expel, return, refouler, or extradite a person to another state where there are substantial grounds for believing that he or she would be in danger of being subjected to torture. This right to non-refoulement as established here, of course, derives obviously from the prohibition of inhumane and degrading treatment, but also, for example, from the right to life. And as you know, these rights are enshrined in a number of treaties, most notably, of course, the ICCPR, but also regional protection systems such as the European Convention on Human Rights, which therefore implicitly contain the non refoulement guarantee under these regional systems. So the regional systems together with the UN Human Rights Treaties provide an additional layer of protection, complementary protection, that also protects war refugees from being returned to the country in which they would face such treatment and such risks. The result of this multilayer protection system, and I'll keep this relatively short because you will obviously be expecting this already, means that various institutions and organizations are involved in the international protection system. This includes most notably, of course, the UNHCR, so the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, which is basically the UN agency in charge of supervising and implementing and aiding state parties to implement the Refugee Convention with 7.7 .7 billion US dollars of a budget. It is almost like a small state and it runs with this budget refugee camps in places such as Kenya or Lebanon or indeed also on the Greek islands. You have seen the UNHCR prominently featured in the news as an important actor in this field. But obviously the more regular, so to say, human rights organizations are also included, such as the human rights treaty bodies to which one can file individual applications, which also look if specific rights are concerned at specific issues and issue reports. And finally, and this has been the focus of my own research, we also have regional courts such as the European Court of Human Rights being heavily involved, particularly in recent years, in questions of migration and asylum and refugee protection. Why are they more involved? Well, I think there are two main reasons here, and I'll conclude with this. On the one hand, of course, we do have a certain rise in the last 10, 15 years of refugee flows. Most notably because there have been intense conflicts, for example, in Syria, for example, in Afghanistan, for example, in Iraq, from which people had to flee and were trying to get to other places in which they could find protection. But on the other hand, and maybe even more noteworthy, states have become increasingly repressive in their approach to forced migration, to the reception of refugees, which comes with, let's put it how it is, violations of the treaty obligations that they have originally signed up for. And therefore, it is not particularly surprising that more and more cases, as you can see on the graphic here, which is actually from my own book, Demanding Rights, which is why it is not surprising that more and more cases have reached the court over these past years. This, of course, has a profound impact on the lives, on the fate of those who are supposedly protected in these instruments. And this is where the notion of migratory vulnerability comes in that I would like to address in the second video.